Just two possible wins left this season for Purdue, and if they get it, they will no longer be atop of this chart. Most tournament wins all time without having a national championship. It's the third all-time Final Four, and, and I want to get your big picture perspective on what it means for Painter, what it means for Purdue fans, historical. But let's start off by talking about that game. That was a wild, fascinating game. It was the worst three-point shooting performance the entire season for Purdue. It was the best offensive performance the entire career for Zach Eadie. Connect couldn't miss a shot no matter who was guarding him. It was a bizarre back and forth wild game with runs on both sides. What was your biggest takeaway from it? Well, first of all, I witnessed the first version of this affair between Purdue and Tennessee in Honolulu back in November. Yep. And that was an absolute rock fight. Tons of fouls called. Uh, it was not the beautiful game, if you will, back in November. So I anticipated we we're going to see something similar to that. And Rick Barnes definitely made sure that this was going to be a very physical game. Dalton Connect just played at another level. Yeah. I mean, he's a lottery pick. You know, if, if Zach Eady, and he is, is number one for the player of the year, Connect is two. Uh, you know, no question. They're both All-Americans. Connect going from northern Colorado to Tennessee. He's an amazing story by himself. But I thought the resiliency showed itself again for Purdue because they got knocked back in the first few minutes. Oh, yeah. I mean, Tennessee came right at them. They couldn't miss. No, and, and – Purdue had to calm down, not take too many ill-advised shots, make sure that Zach got his inside, paint touches, reposting, all those things went for, for Purdue. And then when it mattered most, they rose up the Lance Jones yeah. three, the block that you just referenced in that highlight, because he doesn't get enough recognition, I think, for his rim protection. A lot of shots are altered just by his presence rather than his shot blocking. Right. Um, but that was a case where he just said, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to block this shot at a critical moment. And then just his domination, 40 and 16. If there was ever any question <laughs> about his importance, his status, or what he has meant to college basketball the last couple of years, he answered it. And he's got two more games potentially right. to just cement his status in this game. 22 free throw attempts. Painter ribbed him for missing eight of those attempts and said it would have been a 50-point performance if he just his free throws. I will say one thing that's kind of annoyed me, it's happened on the women's side too. There are people who are upset, <laughs> upset that fouls are being called when they should be called. Like, Zach Eady is tough to score on. He's huge, he's smart, he's incredibly well positioned. It leads to fouls. That doesn't mean the officials are biased. It was like when the Iowa women played West Virginia. West Virginia's style was to be physical to be in your face that leads to foul calls fouls are not supposed to be 15 on one side and 15 on another it's whoever commits the foul gets them called it's really annoying how much coverage there is on wait a minute this guy who's the best of the country at drawing fouls is drawing a lot of fouls well yeah I, i've seen i've covered so many of their games over the last couple of years i've literally seen the scratches right on zach Eady. you know he gets need uh you know back in the back of the knee uh low back everywhere because he's so strong they cannot stop him. And if he gets the ball deep in the post, it's over if he has that kind of position. So what do they try to do? They try to be physical. When, when I was with them in Indianapolis, he was saying after the Grambling State game and the Utah State game, he says, look, everyone keeps trying to be physical with me, and it's not working. <laughs> I mean, he has improved his stamina, his physicality, uh, the fact that he played, what, 39 minutes, 38, 39 minutes? 39 and 27 yeah, seconds. Yeah, I mean, that's remarkable. Just go back three years, uh, it wasn't – you know, yeah, Travian Williams was an outstanding player, and he split time with him. But part of that reason was he couldn't play more than 20, 25 minutes. Yeah. So his endurance has increased dramatically, which, of course, has allowed Purdue to be even better. You know, one of the things that uh, the narratives about Purdue coming into this season was, well, how are they different? What have they learned from last year? Why, why should we believe this team won't again be upset early on in the NCAA tournament? And one of the things I would always say, and I know you said too, is the guards are just better. And part of that is Braden Smith took seven steps forward from his freshman to his sophomore year. Part of that is Lance Jones. And there was a great article in The Athletic talking about the switch defensively when Connect suddenly had Jones on him. All of a sudden, he wasn't hitting all of his three-pointers. In fact, once the switch happened and Jones was defending him, he went like two of eight from behind the three-point line. That little switch, the maneuver by Painter, the maturity and the skill set of Jones as an older guard coming into this program, that's a perfect example of what makes this Purdue team different. And I'm going to add one other thing to your point. Um, their role definition up and down the roster is phenomenal. In this me, 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 you know, era, 
that if I don't get mine, I'm out of here. Ethan Morton. He was highly recruited coming out of high school, and he's taken a back seat. Yep. Obviously, he's struggled a ton to score offensively. In that Gonzaga game, he was on the floor to draw fouls. Two, boom, you're out. He played his role. Caleb first, obviously, at maybe last year, really, he had more of a run. He's taking a back seat. When he comes in, he does his job. You know, Cam Heidi has sort of emerged as sort of that, you know, right behind Mason Gillis as the next best player to come off the bench. He's got a lot of hype coming in. He's taking his role. Mason Gillis is a great example, too. Totally. He's accepted being the sixth man. He's the best sixth man uh, in the Big Ten. And, and, and Miles Colvin. I was just going to say, know, Colvin could player. be doubling his minutes in another program. But yeah. he's smart. He knows it's good for the team. And, and I don't know. Maybe these guys will bolt after you know, next weekend. Uh, but they haven't yet. Right. Trey Kaufman rent. He is waiting his turn and playing the complimentary role. So something's in the water in West Lafayette because right. clearly they're all in there. They're, you know, for the common goal. So many other programs that is not happening where guys are taking their role for trying, or, you know, trying to win a championship and accepting that this particular season, this game, it's not going to be about me. Impressive stuff for a team that, again, didn't even play its best game, not even close, but they move on to the Final Four for the first time since 1980, and this is what the Final Four looks like. UConn-Bama up top, NC State-Purdue down at the bottom. The Boilermakers will play the early game Saturday, just after 6 Eastern time, 5 Central time. But first things first, Purdue had to go home, and they came home to hundreds and hundreds of fans waiting for them. They're riding that Boilermaker Express, holding up their Final Four trophy. What an awesome time to be a Purdue fan. What an awesome time for those players. It's been the, the cloud over the program for so long, the fact that they've had that historic loss as a 1 to a 16 last year. They had to deal with it. They stayed in it. Painter gets through it. Those fans get through it. These players get through it. Big picture. What was it like for you to realize that Matt Painter and all those players finally conquered that? I know there's still two games, but getting to the Final Four is a massive deal for that program. Look, we're all human, and there are relationships, and I I'm just thrilled for them because what they went through a year ago, I mean, look, it's not life or death, but, I mean, in the sport, it was pretty bad, yeah. you know, to be the second team ever to lose – to a 16, but it was also the cumulative effect because the year before they lost to St. Peter's when they shouldn't have in the Sweet 16. They had a right. week to prepare for that game. Go back the year before losing to another double digit, double -digit seed. seeds. You know, so it's happened year after year where they've not met the expectation. And then I'm going to go back to 2019 because 2019 they were the best team. Yeah. Carson Edwards was on a historic run, and it's Virginia, sort of <laughs> symmetry here that has an unbelievable finish to get that game into overtime and beat them in overtime. I was at that game in Louisville, and that was just jaw-dropping. But now here they have a chance to do what Virginia did. And actually, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke with Kyle Guy, you know, part of that 1819, and he told me he texted a lot. Of, he's from Indiana, mm -hmm. so he knows a lot of these uh, Purdue guys. He texted them last year, said, here's what we went through, and referenced, you know, how they got through it. And I just, I love that they embraced... And maybe that's the wrong word, but I really do think they embraced the loss last year. Right. They did not shy away from it. Matt Painter, Zach Eady, all the guys, they came back. They didn't bail. You know, these players that could have bailed, they did not. They worked at it. They played a brutal non-conference schedule. They challenged themselves. They win the Big Ten regular season by multiple games. Um, you know, they did lose in overtime to Wisconsin in the semis. Might have been the best thing for them. Yes. They didn't need that tournament. They could have used rest with Braden Smith's leg injury. So, no, it worked out for them. And here they are with a chance to do something that Virginia did in 1819, yeah. uh, and and really in position to make some history for the university. And I will add that you know we saw that them coming back. I thought it was so great what Zach Eady did yesterday, where he offered a piece of the net yeah. to Gene Cady. Gene Cady really obviously is the architect of what we see in modern day Purdue basketball. You know, one of the great coaches who's a you know Hall of Famer who didn't get to the Final Four. It shouldn't define you, but of course people right. do define you by it. Right. And so he's been brought, you know, he's part of the program. He was Matt Painter's coach. 
And, and that was just a great moment to see him sharing all this. It is amazing. Matt Painter has built this incredible legacy on the back of Gene Cady, who built this incredible legacy. The last time Purdue was in a Final Four, Cady hadn't been hired. He's a Western Kentucky. As the head coach yet at Purdue. That's how long it's been. But I will say, you said something that I know in the back of a Boilermaker diehard fan is starting to become an ember into a flame, which is double-digit seeds have taken them down. And who do they have on Saturday a double-digit seed in NC State. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, they are on an unbelievable Cinderella run. I mean, when they won the title in 83, similar situation. Not expected to be there. They lost four games before the <laughs> ACC tournament. In a row. They played on Tuesday at the ACC tournament. <laughs> it had never happened. Five wins in five days. They do that. In fact, in the semi, it's a Mike O'Connell banked in three to tie that Virginia game. Force overtime. And Virginia had missed a free throw. They make that free throw. It's a four-point game. It's over. Yeah. They don't make the tournament. Head coach may be fired. Oh, yeah. I mean, hidden clause in Kevin Keats' contract that if he wins the ACC tournament, he gets two years extension. So, <laughs> great negotiating there because I don't think they ever thought that was going to happen. And then along the way, they beat Texas Tech. And then in the second round, nothing against Oakland. But that was supposed to be Kentucky. Right. Kentucky loses to Oakland. So, they get Oakland. Beat them. And then Sweet 16... I mean, Marquette, who I'd seen in Indy, played one of its worst games. They beat Marquette. Yeah. And then they take down their arch rival Duke in the Elite Eight, which Amazing. obviously was great for NC State. And so here they are. The Burns ED matchup's going to be great. Horn versus, you know, Smith. Uh, O'Connell's obviously a good shooter. Uh, I just don't think they have the depth. Um, the main thing for Purdue will be don't get tight. Right. Because Don't get swallowed by the moment because, as we've seen, the underdog, the crowd gets going for them. You know, UConn fans will be rooting for NC State. Sure. You know, and so will Alabama fans, I'm sure. So don't get swallowed up by the moment. They have more losses than any Final Four team ever. And yet, they've gone 9-0 and in the last 20 days to get to this point where they are playing Purdue. We'll have more on that matchup in the Final Four coming up just a little bit later on in the show. We're also going to have more basketball with Andy on the men's side as he was covering the Illini and their loss in the Elite Eight. What does he make of that bizarre 30 to nothing run? And up next, Iowa plays in the Elite Eight tonight with a chance to make it back-to-back -back Final Fours. We preview LSU and the Hawkeyes next.